I want to look at Leah, the unwanted and rejected bride. It's important at the beginning of Advent we understand Leah. But to understand Leah, we've got to look in Scripture back and see what's happening. Remember, Abraham was called from Ur and he went to the promised land. He took Lot with him, who was his brother's son, because his brother had died. And there was another brother who stayed there. And he finished up having uh, two grandchildren, Rebekah and Laban. So when Abraham is getting old and he wants a son, his son to have a wife, he sends, him, he sends his uh, servant off to Ur to find a woman from the family. And the servant is a godly person and they say, please, when I go to that place and I stay at the well, please, Give me, some, give me some signs and let me see a member of the family. And that happens. Rebecca comes along, fulfills all the requirements, and she takes him back to the family. And the servant tells the family, I've come because my, my master sent me, and God has told me that if one of your daughters will go back with me, then they can be his wife, but you must allow them to go. So he talks to Bethu, uh, one of the daughter's fathers and appears, and appears to leave the decision to his wife and his son. His son is Laban, and Laban has been impressed by the many precious gifts the servant has brought to him. Laban says to the servant, here she is, take her to be our master's son's wife. As the Lord has directed, he's been very polite with words, but it's a delay in tactic. You see, the problem with the family has been generational sin. They cheat each other. They are very uh, manipulative. So the next day, the next morning, the servant prepares to depart. It's less than 24 hours since he arrived. The mother and brother seek to delay the departure. They stay for another 20 days or a few weeks. And the result is they can't get an agreement, so they said, let's ask Rebecca. Rebecca is the one who's going to go to be the bride. And she agrees to immediately leave. I wonder why. She's in a dysfunctional family. She's looking for a way out. A mother has taught her. She's learnt the family traits. A brother desires wealth and prestige, and he's got this family trait of deceit and cheating. So she goes back and she marries Isaac. Isaac is the second of the patriarchs. But she's barren. She's barren, she doesn't want to do. So Isaac comes and prays for her and she conceives. Isaac is, knows how to talk to God. She's uncomfortable in the pregnancy. And she asks the Lord, God, what is wrong with me? And the Lord says to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people from within you will be separated. One will be the stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. The firstborn is called Esau. It means red because he's got red hair on his body. The second is called Jacob because he's born holding his brother's heel. Jacob means grasping the heel, which in their culture means deceives. And this, is, again, is the family trait. Esau is a man's man. He spends his time with his father hunting. He is his father's favorite. Jacob spends time in the camp. He's a sensitive child. And he spends the time with the women in the camp and with his mother, Rachel. And he's his mother's favorite. The problem here, we've got favorites. Do you have favorites? Because James has told us it's forgiven. Favorites cause a sin. Jesus said we love one another. We love the people in the community. We love everybody. But when we have favorites, it causes division. And here we start seeing a division between the husband and the wife, the eldest son and the second son. One day, the father thinks he's going to die. Isaac thinks, I'm going to die, and he wants to give his blessing to Esau. God has told Rebekah that Jacob was the leader of the tribe when, Jason, when Isaac passes on. She hears Isaac, what Isaac's about to do. And instead of trusting God, she seeks to make it happen. Have you ever done that? You know what God wants, but you seek to make it happen faster than it should do. You try to 
manipulate God. And this is what Rachel, Rebecca is trying to do. Manipulate God's situation because she knows what he wants. Esau goes hunting to fulfill his father's desire. He wants to have broth of wild game before imparting the blessing. So Rebecca gets Jacob and says, this is what we're going to do. You're going to get that blessing. Get me the best two young goats. I know how to make tasty game out of two goats. So Jacob says, what about his hairy body? Don't worry about that. We'll use the hair from the goat on your hands and your neck. So your father will be deceived. See, Isaac is nearly blind. So it's easy for him to be deceived. And then she took Esau's best clothes because it smelled of him. And Jacob put them on. And when he goes in with the food, Isaac says, who is it? Who is it? I've brought the stew for you, but who are you? I'm Esau. And he lies to his father. And then he says, come here. And he smells the clothes and he feels the hands have got hair on them. And he says, who are you? Are you really Esau? And he says, yes, I'm Esau. And then he goes and he says, how could you do that so fast? How did you get an animal so fast? And he says to him, well, the Lord gave me great success. And then that is, he's just blaspheming God. He's using God's name in vain and saying God has given him this game. And finally, before eating the meal, his father again says, who are you? He says, I'm Esau. You see, Rebecca, by undermining her husband, she's teaching Jacob to lie, to cheat, to deceive his father. The head, the elder of the family. You know, do we do that with our children? The way we act, the way we do things. We don't realize our children are picking things up the way we manipulate things. I remember once when i just come back, I was on, back from Taiwan, I'm driving a car down the motor, and my daughter, my eldest daughter, she's only about six, seven years old, she just said, what does that sign say? You know, it's got red round it, a number in it. it. It's a seven and a zero. I said, it's 70, you can't go farther than 70 miles an hour. So I'm driving away, and she says, Daddy, what's that clock down there? And I said, oh, that tells you how fast I'm going. Well, Daddy, you were doing more than 70 then. And immediately you realize your children notice when you commit offenses, which you don't think are offenses. We corrupt our children's minds so easily. And here, Rebecca is corrupting Jacob's mind, his heart, everything he is. But he succeeds in deceiving his father and receives the blessing. When Esau finds out, he plans to kill Jacob. I'll wait until my father's died and we've mourned him, and then I kill him. Rebecca hears about this, and on the pretext of he needs to marry somebody from the family, convinces Isaac to send Jacob to her brother Laban's household to find a wife. The interesting thing is she's never been concerned about who her son should marry before this. Esau has married two women locally, but she wants to get him out of the way so he doesn't die. It's his life she's thinking about, not who he should marry. So Rebecca tells Jacob to wait at her brother's and she will let him know when it's safe to return. She's not expecting him to get married. She's controlling the situation. She's overshadowing God's will for Jacob's life. She has corrupted her son. And the result is she'll not send a message to Jacob to tell him to come back. Why? Because she dies. And Jacob never sees or hears his mother again. It beholds us all to be careful how we deal with our children. She's been a bad influence on Jacob's life. And Isaac, who was going to die, lives for another, what, 25, 25, 30 years. So Jacob travels now to the area his uncle Laban lives in. And he doesn't pray about it, doesn't do anything, he just goes straight in. And the first family member Jacob meets when resting at the communal well is Rachel, Laban's young daughter. She's beautiful to look at, as we read. She's a pleasing figure. Outwardly, she's wonderful. 
But what's inside her? Because Laban has two daughters. The older one is very plain. Rachel is a father's favorite. And after a month, Jacob asks if he'll give Rachel as his wife. And he agrees, providing you first work for seven years, which she does. You see, Leah is invisible to the family because she's plain. She's the opposite of her younger sister, who everybody likes. She's working, doing all the tasks others don't want to do. Her opinions don't count. She's not really wanted. Rachel is the favorite. Rachel is spoiled. Rachel is used to getting her own way. She's loved by her father. She is preferred by her father. Leah just feels like a doormat. She's neglected and loved, taken for granted and wanted, ignored and insulted, rejected. Do you sometimes feel like that with people, how they've treated you? Or how people have used you? She's invisible unless somebody needs something. Laban probably believes no one will pay to marry her. So Jacob, on the day after working free for seven years, asked Laban for his bride. There's a wedding feast is held at night. The bride is brought in wearing ornamental bridal costumes, heavily veiled. And in the dark, they enter the bridal chamber in the tent. They head for a wonderful night of passion. That's interesting. When daylight breaks in, Jacob turns to look at his bride in the face. From a look of shock to unbelief to disgust and finally anger. It's Leah. I didn't want Leah. Think what Leah thinks. Leah who thought Jacob meant all the things he'd said to her through the night. Leah who dared to believe she was accepted. Jacob jumps up. He calls out to Laban. What have you done? How dare you do this to me? Poor Leah's lying there. As the argument ranges around her in the tent, rejected once again, nobody is aware of her pain that they are causing to her heart. She was invisible to them. She knew what her father had done. And the final agreement is that if Jacob completes this week, the bridal week with Leah, then he can have Rachel for a bridal week and have her for good, as long as he works another seven years for Rachel. You know, Rachel, Leah must have found the next seven days heartbreaking. Can you imagine? She's been rejected. Have you been rejected? What a pain in her heart. She thought she was loved for the first time. And now she's just rejected. I just wonder how she would feel during that week and all the time. She knew that, Ray, uh, that uh, Jacob's eyes and heart was for Rachel. How would you feel? Angry, rejected, broken, shamed, used? She's no voice. She's ignored. She can't complain. Yet she's fallen in love with Jacob. But his eyes are looking at somebody else. And then after seven days, she'll be cast aside. And her access to Jacob will be controlled by Rachel. Imagine that situation. You think you've got problems? Here is a woman. He's totally smashed to pieces. And it says that when the Lord saw Leah was not loved, he caused her to conceive. She has a boy, Jacob, the firstborn, and calls him Reuben which means son. And it also sounds like, for he has seen my misery. Referring to God, she believes it's because God has seen her misery. He has given her a son. It's her husband's first son. Surely her husband will love her. Surely he'll accept her now. But no. And she feels unwanted and rejected. She has a second son named Simeon, which means one who hears she believes the Lord has heard that she is not loved. She gave, he's given this one to me too. Surely my husband will show me affection. No. She's still rejected. She's still on the shelf. She conceives a son, again, another son, and calls him Levi, which means attached. 
She hopes her husband will become attached to her because she's born him three sons. Surely he will like me now. No. She's rejected. Each time she gives birth, she thinks she will change her husband's heart. We know we can't do anything to change somebody's heart. Only God's Holy Spirit can change it. Only God's Holy Spirit can change my heart, can change your heart. She conceives a fourth time, another son, and calls him Judah, which comes from the word praise. We realize now Leah has turned a corner. She's no longer seeking to look for her husband's acceptances and love. She's looking to God and praising him. She testifies, she says, this time I will praise the Lord. The Father God now comes first in her heart. Her attitude has changed. She wants to please God. What about Rachel? Well, although she's loved and adored by Jacob, she's barren. She sees her sister, who she's isolated from Jacob's affection and love, as four sons. She demands her husband give her children. This is probably the first time she hasn't got her own way, even though she demands it. For the first time, we see Jacob being angry with Rachel. How do you fulfill a seemingly impossible demand made by the one you love? Am I God? He has kept you from having children. It's not me. I've done everything. So she gives her husband a servant to get children. The servant bears two sons. The first is Dan, which means he's vindicated me because she believes God has vindicated her. She doesn't talk to him. He has listened to her and given her a son. The second is called Naphtali, which means my struggle. Why did she choose this name? Because, she says, I have had a great struggle with my sister and I've won. With her, it's all a game. Who's going to have a son? Who's going to produce the heir? She must be great in her sister in everything. Not only has she put her down, but the one thing she can't match is the sons that Leah is bearing. She's got this elder brother attitude, which you find the prodigal son. Leah was not conceived from time, give Jacob a servant, and she bears two sons. The first is called Gad, which means good fortune. She's still thinking about God and what God is doing for her. She declares how fortunate she is to have another son. And the second son is called Asher, which means happy. Because she's so happy, she knows the women around her will call her happy. Since Leah is looking to God for her affirmation, she has this peace, this joy, this happiness. Do we need to stop looking at what we want or what we need and start looking at what God has prepared for us? Because we miss what God is preparing for us and how he wants to use us because we are trying to use God. And now we have an interesting situation. Reuben, the eldest, goes out hunting. It's Leah's eldest, and he finds some mandrake plants. They're very special. They're a delicacy to eat. So he gives them to his mother to eat as a gift. Rachel sees them and asks for some. Leah says to her, you've taken my husband and now you want my son's gift to me? Rachel tells Leah, if you give me the mandrake plants, you can see with Jacob tonight. Whoa, what an insult to a sister. Can you imagine somebody doing that to you? Rachel is ruthless at getting her own way. What a put down. You know how humiliating. <laughs> Leah must buy a night with her husband using her son's gifts. We must ask, how much does Rachel really love Jacob? Is he just someone she loves to control? Is he a state of stimble? Is he somebody who worships her and she loves to be worshipped? Leah is oblivious to this. Leah just loves Jacob. Leah even goes to tell Jacob of the deal as he returns from work. She's so excited. I bought you for tonight. A love is oblivious to the humiliation she's suffering. The pain may come later if she's rejected and unloved yet again. God sees what's happening. We've forgot our Father God sees everything, including the thoughts of our minds and the intents of our hearts. He sees everything people do to you. 
He knows and he wants to heal. He wants to put his oil upon it. But we must first come to him and look to him, not at the problem, not at the pain. God listens to Leah. She becomes pregnant with a fifth son and calls him Issachar, which is reward. Because God has rewarded me, she's still in God's care. She knows she belongs to God. She gives birth to a sixth son, Zebulun, because she says, God has presented me with a precious gift. Everything is about God now. It's not about her husband. But this time she thinks, maybe you'll treat me with honor. So she calls Zebulun. Zebulun means honor. Now God remembers Rachel. And she gives birth to a son. God has taken away a disgrace, which if you didn't bear children in those days, you were disgraced. She names him Joseph, which means thank you, God. No, which means may he add. She makes a request, may the Lord add me another son. I want another son. So what's the point of this historic story? God is at work in a dysfunctional family. He's working through them. He's trying to bring out his love and his grace within that family. But he's also blessing those who are rejected. God knows their hearts. He knows their weaknesses. So God instructs Jacob to go home. Not Rebecca, she's dead. But before they go, Rachel shows her true colors. She steals her family idols. She, she's going back to where Abraham and Isaac are. And they worship the one true God. She wants to take idols back with her. She wants to bring something into the family which will cause the enemy to control them. And on the way home, it's wonderful because Jacob now is learning to walk with God more and more. And he makes peace and he's reconciled to his brother Esau. You know, Jesus probably was thinking about Esau and Jacob when he told the parable of the prodigal son. But on the way home, Rachel gives birth to her second son. Just before she dies in child, but so she curses the child. She calls him B Oni, the trouble, my trouble, the son of my trouble. But Jacob immediately jumps in and changes the name to Benjamin, son of my right hand. She never sees Jacob's family home or meets her father-in-law. She's just buried by the roadside. Two women in Leah affected Leah. The one who affected her husband, Rebecca has gone. It's as though God has said, that's enough, enough. And now Rachel is gone. And all we've got now is the two people God has been working on, Jacob and Leah. So what of Leah? She develops this relationship with Jacob. How do we know? How do we know that she started to develop a deep relationship with Jacob? Well, when she dies, it was Jacob who placed her in the true tomb containing Abraham and Isaac and their wives. And before Jacob died in Egypt, he gave instructions to her sons to bury me with Leah. Not bury me with Abraham or my father, but bury me with Leah. Something has changed. It takes him until he's in Egypt at the end of his life before he gets peace and he stops having favorite children. God vindicated Leah and used her. She does not seem to have the trait of deceit and manipulation that the others have. Two of her sons became of great blessing. One to Israel, Levi, from which we have Moses, Aaron, and the priesthood. And finally, the great high priest, Leah was the one who started that line. The second is Judah. She started the line, the kingly line in Israel. King David was the first king of that line. Leah was the mother who gave birth to them.
So this line of Judah is a line of rejected mothers. When you look at the line, you see there's Leah there, rejected at the beginning. And then we've got Tamar. She's the daughter-in-law of Judah. And then Rahab, the prostitute. And then Ruth, the Moabitess. And finally Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was a young girl who was cut off from her family because they thought she had a child out of wedlock. She was the last mother of the line, bringing Jesus. Leah started the line to Jesus. Mary finished it. Mary, the mother who bears the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. The line of Jesus who was rejected and loved by most Jews and Gentiles is really the unwanted bridegroom neglected by the church. Think about it. How did you get married? Marriage is a shadow of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Think of it. You you see somebody and you like them, so you make a relationship with them. You want to be with them more and more, and you suddenly become an item. And after that time, it, it builds up in you. And then you say, I want to promise. I want to marry you, but here's I want to be engaged to you. I want to a guarantee that I want you. And you give them a ring. And then you continue more and more developing your relationship until the day of the wedding. And this is a picture of us and the church. We know that Jesus is our bridegroom. He's waiting for his heaven. The Father's ordained that he, we, the church, each one of us, will be his bride. So what happens? We slowly get to know him. And we find, yeah. Jesus is God and we ask, we want him to be our boyfriend. We want him to be, we we get converted and we get excited about Jesus and we get so excited about Jesus and we start obeying him that we're given an engagement ring. That engagement ring, it's a promise, it's a guarantee. And what is the engagement ring? The guarantee word in Greek is engagement ring. In modern Greek, that guarantee. And God says he gives the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that we will be the bride of Christ. So we've got really passionate now. And for about after this engagement, when we get the Holy Spirit, we're really excited for maybe 10 years, 11 years, maybe longer. But our engagement is going to be until the end of our life. And we get complacent. We lose the passion, the desire. We become disobedient, indifferent. We start to compromise and get blamed as we get older. Everything's been there and we just want to get to heaven but we're not bothered about much else. We lose that love, that deep love we had when we first met Jesus. When it should get deeper and deeper. Some of us, you know, we take the ring off sometimes because we want to be disobedient. Never mind the Holy Spirit. I want to get involved with this. I want to get involved with things and we take it off whereabouts are you in this marriage are you walking along getting deeper and deeper into Jesus have you become complacent I'm all right where I am I'll manage to the end don't worry see Leah gave a legacy the priesthood and the Christ, the line to two of them. We each will leave a lesser legacy. God has chosen each one of us. We've got different DNA. We've all got a special gift. We've all got something special to do from God. But we only can do it if we are in him and with him all the time. Our legacy, one of our legacies to the future is through our children and our grandchildren, for our adopted grandchildren, from the people we know in the church. That's our legacy. You see, we teach what we know, but that doesn't change people. But we impart what we are. Do I impart what I am? Am I in God? Am I so in God that I impart his presence wherever I go? 
I can teach till the cows come home. I can teach you here forever. It will not change your heart. But if I can impart God into your heart, it will upset you. It will change you. And it will cause you to be thirsty for him. And that's what God wants. He wants us to impart what we are to our families, to our grandchildren, to those around us in the church. So we've got to ask ourselves this morning, who are we most like? Rebecca lost her life. She didn't follow what God wanted. She had the opportunity. Laban never bothered. He worshipped idols. Just manipulated. Rachel, who preferred the family idols and the way of doing things rather than the living God. Jacob, who's forever making mistakes, compromising. But God, he keeps coming back to God and God will get him where he wants him in the end. And he does after he's gone through the trauma of thinking his eldest son is dead. And then we've got Leah. Leah is a nobody. Leah is a person who nobody would have chosen to be the first mother in the line to the king of kings and lord of lords. Nobody would have chosen her to be the first in the line of the priests. And yet there she is. Amazing. But we look at people for what we see on the outside like Jacob looked at his wife, Rachel. But God looks on the heart and he's looking at each of our hearts and saying, I can do this with you if you just yield to me. Are we prepared to let, to yield to him? See, Jesus died so we might have this power to be like him to be like the one who's going to the bride of Christ he was rejected he died he shed his blood for us he washed away our sins he breaks all the chains of all the things that people have put around our hearts and our spirits he breaks them off through his precious blood Our Father God so much wants us to be like his son, to be compatible with his son. So when we marry, it'd be a wonderful time. See, God specializes in using rejected, broken people. So we've no excuse. It's not about what we know. It's about who we are in God. Leah is buried with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their wives. And she was the source of the tribe of Levi, and Judah. What is God wanting you to be in this life? What has God put you on this earth especially for? And are you prepared to embrace it? Because it means looking to him and nobody else. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you search our hearts. Help us to so much want to be in you that we do your will, that we fulfill your ministry within our lives. Whether it's a small ministry or a big ministry, may we so yield to you and allow you to touch and break all the chains and ropes which have bound around us what people have done to us. But not only that, to cleanse out all the sin within all our own lives which have hindered us from seeing the wonder of who you are. Give us again that compassion. Give us again that passion we had when we first met you as Lord, when we first knew your Holy Spirit within us. Give us that passion and may it grow and grow to the end of our lives so you might be so thrilled to see us enter into heaven. We ask it in your name. Amen.